A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. He went to visit them, and because he practiced the same trade, stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. Every Sabbath, he entered into discussions in the synagogue, attempting to convince both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began to occupy himself totally with preaching the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. When they opposed him and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your heads. I am clear of responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So he left there and went to a house belonging to a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next to a synagogue. Crispus, the synagogue official, came to believe in the Lord along with his entire household and many of the Corinthians who heard, believed, and were baptized. The word of the Lord. The Lord has revealed to the nations his saving power. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done wondrous deeds. His right hand has won victory for him, his holy arm. The Lord has revealed to the nations his saving power. The Lord has made known his salvation. In the sight of the nations he has revealed his justice. He has remembered his kindness and his faithfulness towards the house of Israel. The Lord has revealed to the nations his power. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation by our God. Sing joyfully to the Lord, all you lands. Break into song, sing praise. The Lord has revealed to the nations his Dominus Fabiscum, et cum spiritus tuo, Flexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Johannem, Jesus said to his disciples, A little while and you will no longer see me, and again a little while later you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what does this mean that he is saying to us? A little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me, and because I am going to the Father. So they said, what is this little while of which he speaks? We do not know what he means. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, are you discussing with one another what I said, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while you will see me? Amen, amen, I say to you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will become joy. Verbum Domini.
We've got some explaining to do, I guess, this morning. <laughs> the antiphon we said, we sang, the choir beautifully sang, was uh, for Joan of Arc. It's an optional memorial today, and I don't mean any slight to Joan of Arc, but I, I wanted to preach on some of the prayers of the Mass text for the Easter weekday. Of course, Joan of Arc, the patroness, one of the patroness of France, liberated um, her country from the English you know, in the 1400s was a great martyr for the faith at age of 19 due to some political machinations in the church, was accused and convicted of being a heretic and burned at the stake. And 20 years later, she was completely, 20 years too late, exonerated of the charges and made a saint, I think, in 1920. But certainly a great inspiration <clears throat> for the world and for France at the moment. She faces different challenges in, in the country of France. So we certainly ask for her prayers and intercession this day. The Easter weekday uh, prayers uh, from the preface and the closing prayer, I was looking at them and seeing that it's a beautiful theme of life. You know, in, in the gospel today, he's speaking of this going away a little while and coming back as a reference to his his suffering, death, and resurrection. You know, the third day he rises again. So it's speaking of this coming event that's gonna happen, he's trying to explain it to the disciples. And it is through that death and resurrection that we are redeemed. And the closing prayer at Mass today, I'll say, Almighty ever-living God who restore us to eternal life and the resurrection of Christ, Increase in us, we pray, the fruits of this Paschal Sacrament and pour into our hearts the strength of this saving food. That the purpose of his death and resurrection was to restore us to eternal life. You know, this whole Easter season we have, um, you know, leading up to Pentecost, focuses us on the resurrection, on these encounters with Christ, and this new life that he gives us. You know, we have different expressions expressions of this of walking in newness of life or a new participation in grace a filial adoption that we become Christ's brethren first corinthians 15 tells us that he died for our sins was buried and raised on the third day this is the crowning truth of our faith that with the cross the resurrection or you know, with the cross as an essential part of the paschal mystery it's the principle and source of our future resurrection. The Catechism sums it up very succinctly. It says, by his death, Christ liberates us from sin, and by his resurrection, he opens for us the way to new life. And this principally is justification that we receive in baptism, you know, is increased in confirmation, sacrament of confirmation, and every Eucharist we receive increases that justification, the sanctifying grace that we receive through his Paschal mystery. Justification means we're being reinstated in God's grace. Where we lost that initial grace due to original sin, Jesus is meriting for us that grace back. When we're born dead in our sin without, you know, another word for Sanctifying grace is this divine life, is this life of God. You know, that we're born without that, Jesus is giving us that back through his suffering, death, and resurrection. In the preface today, the part, the, that prayer, I say the Mass right before the, the Sanctus, we're told this beautiful phrase. It says, through him, the children of light rise to eternal life and the halls of the heavenly kingdom are thrown open to the faithful. For his death is our ransom from death, and in his rising, the life of all has risen. The halls of the heavenly kingdom are thrown open. I love that. Imagine big wooden doors thrown open that all could come in to these beautiful halls of the heavenly kingdom. It was shut due to sin, shut due to our original sin, and subsequent personal sin in our life, that the children of light rise to eternal life, that we who believe in Christ, repent of our sins, we become children of his light, that we reflect 
his light in the world, we will one day rise from the dead to eternal life. So we see that Christianity is about um, this new freedom of living in the light of eternal life and the forgiveness of sins and new life, divine life that he wants to give us. So that's at the heart of it, forgiveness of sins and new life. We see that in the Garden of Eden with the original sin and subsequent personal sin in our life, we inherit that original sin as being part of the family of man. Um, we see this linkage with death, right? That's when death and suffering entered the world. So the gospel is coming to, as the Father said, to undo that knot of disobedience that man originally committed, that sin of pride and disobedience, where sin brought death, faith and forgiveness and new life comes in Christ. So the gospel is a gospel of life. The message of life is at the very heart of the gospel. Our God is a God of the living, you know, we're told in the, in the scriptures. And our origin, on a natural level, our origin, our natural life, comes from God. As I said many times here, that our human souls are created, an immediate act of creation. The church uses that language. It's a formal teaching of the church that God, at the moment of conception, creates the human soul and imparts that soul in the person. So the, the couple come together to procreate. They don't create, we say, they procreate. They, with the assistance of God, new life is brought into the world. In no way can the couple produce a human soul. That comes directly from God. <laughs> and that's, <coughs> I think that's very important for us to remember today because no matter what the difficulty is or the terribleness even of the circumstance of the conception of the conjugal act there, that God wills us all into existence. Now, the human person has a right to be conceived and born of an act of love. You know, the, the child in a human family, we speak of that as a right, and we need to protect that as best we can in a society that is a marriage culture that fosters healthy marriage and things and chastity. But, you know, regardless of that, God is acting. He is acting in human history that he willed each of us into existence. He wanted us to be, despite the circumstance, if it was a bad circumstance even, he willed us to be, and our origin comes from him, and our destiny is to be with him forever. Our end is in God, who is the fullness of life. And we had those beautiful passages last Sunday uh, we, Jesus is praying that we may be one, that they may be one with each other and in us, he says. So he's come to foster this unity, this communion of the church, of oneness, and that they may be, you know, we as human beings may be one in God to receive this life that he wants to give us. That's the purpose of our life. So that's that's the basis of our dignity, that we're made in the image of likeness of God, that we come from him and we're destined to be with him for eternal life. <coughs> so as part of the human family, we have a, you know, important role to protect that dignity of life, you know, in the culture by just laws. And I, I wanted to preach a little bit about this because it's so much in the, our national discussion today, it's in the media a lot, about abortion laws in our country. And oftentimes, um, you know, the Christian perspective and is categorized as being extreme. It, in Alabama recently passed a bill that, you know, the cultural elite is going berserk in our country saying this is so extreme. But, you know, the law is there to protect life. And, and it, it's a fundamental right that we have that all of the rights are based upon. And you can never take innocent life. You can never have the direct killing of an innocent life. 
you know, federally, and I, I want to make a point that this law isn't extreme. What's extreme is America's, federally speaking, what it allows in this country, that abortion is allowed throughout nine months of pregnancy, that the United States of America, whose whole mission and goal has been one of freedom, is one of seven countries to have this liberal of an abortion law. Out of 198 countries surveyed, seven allow abortion for nine months of the pregnancy. We stand in solidarity with North Korea and China, who have a very you know, terrible history of human rights. America, the land of freedom, is standing with those country, countries. I, I don't think, oftentimes in our culture, we realize the scope of abortion, that 55, and this is just an estimate, you know, for surgical abortions, 55 million abortions per year globally. It's the leading cause of death in the world. That's not something small, you know, that's not something that we can just ignore. In this country alone, 60 million surgical abortions since Roe versus Wade, 1973. 60 million. One in four women by the time they're 45 in this country will have had an abortion. And this is not counting you know, chemical abortions, over-the-counter drugs that a, a woman can obtain to have an abortion. Those numbers would make it much higher. So the recent bill signed into law, supposed to take place in six months, there's already an injunction against it, is signed in Alabama, is signed by Governor Kay Ivey. You know, there's been a lot of talk in the media about this is just uh, a bunch of men promoting this to oppress women. Our governor is a woman. You know, she signed this into law. You know, it's considered extreme by the elite of our country today. And this really kind of got me going <laughs> when I, I saw on a, a popular talk show that they were saying, well, this is people imposing their personal morality on others. They're imposing their faith. And the church's explanation of this is that the pro-life laws are part of the natural law. Here in Birmingham, Alabama, there's a, a center for the great civil rights struggle in this country in the 60s, 50s, and 60s. And Martin Luther King did a lot of work here. And his letter from a Birmingham jail in 1963, when he's writing about segregation, he quotes St. Augustine, he quotes St. Thomas Aquinas and speaking about the natural law. And he's saying that any, he, he writes about an unjust law, you know, is measured by this natural law to determine if it's just or unjust. That all just laws are rooted in the natural law. That God is the lawgiver, his eternal law. We can know that law through reason, we speak of it as participating in that eternal law of God, known by reason, that through reason, we know that taking of innocent life is wrong, and it's always wrong in all cases. So this great leader appeals to reason for just laws. So you don't have to open your Bible to see that abortion is wrong. You don't have to be a person of faith to know that abortion is wrong. And it is a binding on all people. It's a human right. You know, the pro-life, you know, the cause of life is a human right. And it is the human rights of issue of our time. So they, the pro-life laws are reasonable. It can be known by, when we say right reason, we have fallen reason. And that's where faith can come in and help to purify our reason because it very much is part of our faith. It is found in scripture, this right to life, and it can energize us and motivate us, you know, to fight for a just system. So it applies to all. And, and a government, in protecting this most fundamental of rights, you know, needs to, needs to do that, it needs to enact legisl legislation to protect it. So the church is teaching 
And why it's reasonable, why we can know this from reason is that from the time of fertilization, a new life has begun, which is neither that of the father or the mother. This is not some organ of the mother's body. The unborn child has its own life, its own growth, its own DNA, possibly you know, a different blood type than the mother, will develop its own fingerprints. It's a human life that's developing on its own. And not to protect that or to, to take that life is to end a human life, distinct from that of the mother. Every genetics textbook in the country will recognize this. So through reason, we know that this is human life. So our law must protect it. Now it's the child, the unborn child is radically dependent on the mother and the mother is entrusted with this gift and has a tremendous responsibility and the culture needs to support her and aid her you know, in being a parent. But you know, the church teaches that it would never be human if it were not human already. That there's nothing there to change it. You know, we've even had some crazy politicians <laughs> promoting infanticide. That after the child's born, you can let the child die. I mean, that's insane. And so what's the difference? You know, like five minutes before the birth? Two months, three months, four months, you know, there is no line that's crossed that we say, oh, now the unborn child is human. Because a human life has begun. We also, I think, always have to recognize that individually, you know, no woman, I don't think, really obviously wants to have an abortion. If they feel driven or compelled, they feel like they have no choice, driven by fear, maybe they have no support, maybe the father has abandoned them. They feel pressured into this choice. So obviously, a pro-life culture needs more than just laws to protect life. We need a true culture that supports uh, the woman and the child and to try to relieve this fear and pressure. And Christianity, the gospel, also brings this great message of mercy towards women that have been uh, involved in abortion, and men have been involved in abortion, that there is forgiveness and that hopefully they can find support, especially in the Christian community, to, su to find support you know, in being a parent. But we do need to recognize the great injustice that abortion is in our country and to work to overturn it, to fight for the cause of life.